And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Ian Campbell, who's had ET involvement for most of his life. He has a background in film and television, and in the summer months, he spends his time filming the night sky with night vision cameras while using various modalities to help promote peaceful contact. Ian, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Ian, I think one of the things that started your interest in UFOs is you had some sort of major sighting or contact when you were 12 years old. Can you tell us about that? I did. I'm just going to show you a picture just of what I looked like at 12 to give you an idea of what I experienced at this age. Um, So this is me. And um, the summer of 1969, this is also the summer of 69, um, I had a friend that uh, came over to do a little bit of camping in my uh, backyard. And I'm in the same house now that I was when I was eight years old. Um, I've taken over. My mother passed away years ago. But in 69, my friend came over and we were in, in, in our tent and our feet were probably in the tent as we were laying back in our sleeping bags, just enjoying you know, the night sky and all that it offered. Um, I enjoyed looking up. I think my friend got bored relatively quickly and went back into the tent and forgot about it and went to sleep. But I stayed out and I was looking up and all of a sudden this green might have been 25 feet, I'm guessing, in diameter, just floated over the um, the Norwegian maple that's in the backyard and I don't know whether it stopped or if it just kept going. It was moving south if it kept going or whether there was um, any period that it was stationary. The weirdest thing, Jeff, was I know myself well enough that something like that should have terrified me, but it didn't. I was completely calm. It makes no sense. And the weird part about it is when I processed it, I, I went back in the tent there was no compulsion to wake my friend up to say, oh, my God, I just saw a UFO, which a kid would normally do. Instead, I went to sleep. The next morning, I never mentioned it to my friend. I never mentioned it to my mother. It makes no sense to me or it didn't make sense to me then. And it doesn't make sense to me now. So my feeling is, and I don't know whether it's accurate or not, that whatever it was curated or, or created that, um, what would the word be? that emotional response that I had. So that to me is something that for years has just confounded me as to what it was. So that was really the start of something that really made me realize too, that there were things that happened in, in infancy as well, leading up to this, but this was really the, um, the major one. Let me stop you for one moment. So what you saw was a green light or a green orb? I'm not really clear on that. It looked like a craft. In other words, it had form, but it was glowing so bright, like it was a very, very bright neon green. Um, And it was drifting very slowly and silently. If it, I've seen orbs, I'm going to show you a a video of, of orbs. I don't think this was an orb. I think it was a craft that had extraordinarily um, bright illumination. The um, the edges of it though, were undulating almost like you would see a jellyfish in water, but no sound and it just moved on. If it may have been an orb, but to me it felt more like, you know, looking at it, looking back on it, it seemed like it would be more likely a craft of some type. Do you feel like this craft was sending out a signal that kept you calm and relaxed? Definitely. Only because I know myself well enough that I would um, probably be jumping out of my skin having an experience like that. So it, it really, as I say, it didn't make any sense that there, that I processed it in a way that was ordinary. And it wasn't ordinary, but it was, as I say, as ordinary as seeing a city bus going by. I mean, I knew intellectually it wasn't, but on a soul level or in terms of just the uh, the way it felt, it didn't, it was like nothing to see here, move on. And I thought that was weird. I don't even know if maybe I was supposed to remember it. Who knows? I may be jumping ahead of myself here, but you've had contact that even goes back to infancy as well as contact past this. 
That's right. Is it possible that these beings in the ship knew you and were just checking in on you? Yeah, I, I wonder. A lot of people, I think, make claims, and I, I'm so afraid to because I really don't know. It's such a mystery, but I think there's a very good chance that that is the case because my earliest memory, Jeff, goes back to infancy. And I know I've heard, you know, infants, babies don't have sight, but I have memories that, that involve vision. So maybe my memories aren't quite infancy, but a little bit older, but it started right at the very beginning. And uh, I just talked to somebody a little while ago and they say they remember things at six months old. And so it confounds me why I would have this memory. But it's, again, like that ship that I just talked to you about over the uh, the maple tree. It's confounding because the memory is so real. You know, I wonder, Jeff, if, if you go back, if we were able to go back to view what we're describing in the, in, in the present, how different it would be. But something happened. It was real. It was so real that when I describe it to you, I, I even ask nurse practitioners about one aspect of it to, to say, is this really what they do in um, in, 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 in wards with, with with newborns? And they went, heck no. So it's interesting. So do you want me to explain that? Or is there uh, another um, element that you'd like to uh, talk about first? Yeah, sure. Tell us what happened when you were an infant or a toddler. What happened is I'm just going to share with you a, a graphic that I prepared. This is kind of what it felt like. This is a very crude um, graphic, but <clears throat> there's this conveyor belt. I remember there were a, a bunch of infants, including myself. Now, what I remember was on the side of the conveyor belt system was a, a bucket where there was a liquid where we were being bathed. And at the end of the conveyor belt, there were um, nurse practitioners, if that's what they were, taking care of the babies. Um, the era seemed like, and I'm, I've heard other people say things like this, that it was from, it felt like from times past, it felt like it might have been from the 30s, rather than something that was, um, um, you know, late 50s. So I don't know really what this was, but the, the beings, they seemed like nurse practitioners, they were very thin, they felt to me like they could be tall whites. Um, most of the encounters that I've had with beings have been tall whites, maybe Nordics. The issue that I have with recall with um, any being that I've, that I've encountered is, and I think it's something that's a protective, um, something within me that's protecting me. I do not ever have um, recall of any facial features on, on any being that I've ever seen. And this was the case here as well. Well, you're saying that they may have been like tall whites. So I'm assuming they were humanoid-like, at least. Very much so. Very much so. But it did seem, like I say, that it felt like an era that was long gone. And the thing that was interesting, I've met people that are nurses, and I've said, do they use conveyor belts <laughs> in a nursery? They're going, I, no, um, never heard of that one before. So this, to me, is odd, but it's a real memory that, uh, that I have to this day. Do you think it's possible that you have an alien implant in your body somewhere? I've never found one um, th that I'm aware of. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, real estate on a human body, but I've not found uh, an implant. But I don't necessarily know that they're all ne um, as easy to find as maybe some. I know Whitley Strieber has one in his ear mm -hmm. um, that's um, quite prominent that he's had, you know, he's attempted to have removed. I don't think I have, but I, I don't know. But I do think that this, you asked a really good question about the, the the craft that was above the maple tree. And that is, yes, I do think there's a, a through line from infancy, you know, to this day that um, is hard to kind of wrap my head around. All right. What other footage do you have of UFOs that you can share with us that also may connect you with your past? Okay, Jeff, this is... Um, 2021, when I was taking some pictures out over the water, and I'm zooming in on the shot. This is what I found in the image. It's a streak coming through that I didn't see when I was uh, taking the shots. But these images, when I reviewed them afterward, showed the first one, the streak, and the second one showed this tic tac like thing hanging in the um, in the air. And following that was an unexpected period of just absolute bliss that lasted for. Um, 
a full six months. It was unrelenting. So this was some sort of spontaneous bliss that you experienced? Yeah, it hit hard. It came out of nowhere. And the weirdest thing is if you tell people you had a, a, a period of you know pure bliss for six months, they go, oh, that's great. But it's not because um, when you want to sleep or when you ha when you want to just have quiet time, it's constantly just like the adrenaline is, adrenaline is pumping and it just doesn't back off. So it's it's good in some respects, but in another sense, it's it was nice after the six months when it just kind of backed off and I went back to uh, life as I always lived it. Now, let me get something straight here. You took the photos and you didn't see the ships in the photos, right? No, because as, as you, you might have noticed when I was zooming in, they were pretty distant. And then when you're fumbling with your phone to take a picture, you're, you're, you're composing the shot. You're not necessarily thinking that there might be something in the blue sky. And that's when I saw it afterwards. So you didn't see it until you got home and started editing the pictures? Yeah, probably that night when I was just reviewing them, looking at, looking at them on my, uh, on my phone and just seeing what might have looked like um, almost like a little speck and then just um, expanding the, the picture and going, oh, actually, that looks like a streak. And then moving on, oh, that one looks like a Tic Tac. Um, and then, as I say, it wasn't long before that period of bliss just kind of uh, took it took over. So the period of bliss started while you were editing the photos or when you were actually taking the pictures earlier that day? Oh, no, it would have been probably when I was looking at the pictures that it hit. So it would have been that evening. Hmm. And it might not have been instant. It could have been an hour later. But there was just a real tr a sense that there was a, a connection between seeing these images and then um, um, having this boom, full on onslaught of um, uh, of bliss. And that's what led to an inquiry into all the other stuff that's happened prior, because, you know, when you have had experiences in your life, you can either scratch your head until the cows come home um, or pack it away and choose to do nothing about it. And sadly, at my age, I let 50, uh, about 50 years go by without really looking at what happened when I was a kid. So I think this was kind of, um, I don't know whether it was a deliberate a a intervention or whether it was just a happy uh, accident, but definitely the bliss, I'm absolutely positive, was, um, was related to this, without a doubt. While you were out there shooting pictures, is it possible that you experienced missing time? Mm, I don't think so because you know there there were people visiting and and I, nobody mentioned it and I didn't feel I did but the um the one time I felt that I might have is when I was talking to you earlier when I was 12 years old and the that craft came over the um the the maple I have a sense that there might have been then because you know I was 12 years old um it was nighttime kids don't keep track of time my friend had gone into to, into the tent to sleep so I think that I've had missing time because I've had experiences where I've been taken. So I don't know where where and when these things happen because I when these things occur, I don't ever remember the missing time element or the going to aspect. It's just I'm there. But I don't think in this case, Jeff, there was a, a missing time event. When you started feeling this extreme bliss, did you think you were going crazy or anything like that? You know, I probably should have, because wouldn't that be the first, that, that would be a go-to, um, um, I would think the first thing most people would go to. No, I just felt it was related. It was related to something earlier. And it, But no, I didn't, I don't think I'm going crazy or, and I didn't, it didn't make me feel I was. And I've never felt with any of the things that I've gone through that, uh, why is this happening to me? I think it's happening to way more people than we probably realize. So it just felt like there was just a, a sense that this was begging me to maybe do an inquiry, um, which is what I did um, because of this. I don't think if I had that blissful period, I would have wanted to um, reach out to, to see if there were answers. And I'm an idiot because I figured if I asked a question, somebody would answer my, my question. But you probably realize when you ask a question, you walk away with a million more, which is kind of unfortunate because you never you get you jump down that rabbit hole. But because of this, I reached out to um, Kathleen Martin 
because I'd seen her on a number of documentaries and um, found her website. I told her about this. I sent her these pictures. And I mean, she was so lovely because I figured when I sent her the email, I'm thinking, what the hell did I do that for? She's busy. She's not going to show any um, or have any time for this. And she wrote me a lovely email and saying, I do understand these things are, are, are a concern for people. Um, and I reached out to her again saying, do you know of any practitioner in the um, Toronto area or in my area that might be able to work with me to see if we can sort of dig into some of the things that have occurred in my past? And she gave me the uh, the name of a practitioner locally, Leslie Mitchell Clark, who I went to see, who was wonderful. Um, and for anyone that's watching this, I was so terrified to even consider um, hypnosis, thinking that it was going to um, be difficult, traumatic, where you lose control. And I realize it, it it's none of that. You're in full control, but you do kind of come up with answers. I do have one thing that I think prevented me from maybe learning a little bit more than I wish I, I there's always more that you'd like to learn. But you know that old adage, um, uh, picture this in your mind. I always thought that it was just a, a, a figure of speech, but I was watching a program and I found out that there's a condition called aphantasia and I'd never heard of it before. And what it is, is your third eye is an active. And I do not have an active third eye. And so when I went, you know, to hypnosis, and had my sessions, I found it difficult to go into trance, although I did. And I think I might go and have another session because when I told Leslie, I couldn't, when she was giving me directives to, to get me into hypnosis, I can't visualize. And that's interesting when you talk about missing time. I'm wondering if there's been a limitation placed on my third eye vision to shut down perhaps screen memories or anything that might be um, likely to come to mind that maybe I'm not supposed to know. But yeah, it came as a real shock to learn that when most people can visualize things, I can't. And I would talk to people and say, you mean to say if you think of a, an apple that you can see it in your mind's eye? Oh yeah, I can see an apple. I'm like, really? So this to me seems like that limitation may be um, related to something that was attempting to block my memory. And uh, I'm just, that's something I'm very curious about. So you're saying that you went to a hypnotherapist and it was unsuccessful because you just couldn't retrieve those memories. I think there's more to retrieve. She ended up getting me into a state where I was able to recall a few things that I didn't remember, but I feel there's more depth to, um, to to what could be uncovered when i went to um to leslie we talked about the um my um the memory that i had of being an infant on the conveyor belt being nursed or rather being taken care of by tall whites that gave me an opportunity to just, to see that or remember it more clearly where um all of a sudden as i mentioned there was a wash basin at the side that came into to memory and the other thing is the nurses had gloves on, but they weren't latex or rubber. They were more like a, a powder blue microfiber type glove. Um, so th that kind of clarity um, came forth. Um, also, I had other things that, that were um, brought out through, through Leslie. And I'm not saying she didn't get me to trance, but it was not as easy as I was, as I would, I, I, I'd hope it to be. But I do think that that blockage is um, something that's come with the experience that I've had earlier in life. So you're saying that the blockage was intentional, most likely by the ETs. I did book um, a session with Kathleen Martin, and uh, I went to her website and I, I booked a session with her. And she gave me a meditation and she said, I think that it's possible. She She couldn't say in any definitive sense that there was a band or anything placed over the third eye, but she gave me a meditation to work with. And she said, I'd like you to work with this um, for three days as much as you can, and let's see what happens. And it did start to unlock some, um, some ability to, to see my third eye, but I can't willfully see something. I just see things occasionally that decide to show up. So it's, 
I think it's a sense or it's a, an ability that's still lacking, but it's um, it may be coming along, which would be great. Uh, Kathleen is a really, really skilled um, hypnotherapist and what she gave me picked in within a couple of days, but it, it's not as full bodied as some people who are able to just visualize, um, you know, anything that they put their mind to. Do you have any memories of ever being on a craft? I do. Yeah, if I could share one with you, I think it would be interesting because it's a bit odd in terms of the the room that I was in. It didn't seem craft like, but anyway, here is a picture that was taken in downtown Toronto. Somebody took it because I wanted to illustrate to people. It seems odd to be in a room on a craft that's constructed at 90 degree angles with tall windows from floor to ceiling. Years prior, when I was about five, six, seven years old, I was on a craft where the windows were floor to ceiling in a room that was constructed like a, a, a normal room would be. I was standing with three beings that I assume are like my family. We were all in uh, in either robes or dark gowns of some sort. And as you can see in the uh, in the image, the the lights that we're looking at are craft in the distance. And I feel like I'm with family and we're all just kind of like hanging together. So the next picture shows up. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards here. This is the progression. This is another um, instance where I was on this same craft with my family. However, I'm also able to view from behind. I was on a riser on or on a couple of steps higher than the, the people in the foreground watching them and myself from a different perspective, which is so weird. But um, I remember it as clear as day. And what I find really interesting is that there's an experiencer named Sev Talk who I saw do a presentation who talked about being in a room exactly like this. And she described it as being in like a penthouse or in a condo or in an office space where you've got the glass from floor to ceiling. And she was saying, it doesn't make sense because I feel like I'm more in a in a commercial building or in something that we're familiar with here uh, on this earth plane, but clearly we're not. And this is exactly the same um, encounter that I had. Can you share with us some of your night vision goggle videos? I can. This, Jeff, is a, uh, um, a frame grab that I took from a video of um, the cubes that were flying over my place in December. On December 15th, these cubes came over the place twice on the 15th and twice on the 19th. And this is um, the best frame grab that I could get from that. Okay, one of the videos that I shot was um, a video of a cube coming over uh, my place in December, just a few months ago. And it came twice on the 15th and it returned on the 19th when I had my cameras out. So let me start the video here for you to have a look at. Did you see that come through? Mm -hmm. There it is again. I'm coming closer in on it and closer still. <clears throat> What's particularly interesting about that, it looks like it's falling. It's not as traveling from the west, moving east. I checked the weather and the, the winds were coming from the west. So it's traveling against the wind and they all were coming that direction. And the wind was either west or um, south, southwest. I'm sorry, some from the south, south or south, southwest the entire time. So I have four of those on video that are coming through. I got in touch with um, um, MUFON in uh, Missouri because they had a case where they were seen going right across the state over one one day with a number of um, individuals who got recordings of this. Comparing this video that I just shared, uh, Jeff, with what was shot in Missouri, it looks like it's the same craft or the same type of craft. And I can move on and show you some other examples. This is the um, this is a cylinder that I recorded in. September. So let me just play this for you. Wow. 
That was nice. It, it, that, you know what was amazing is that I usually when I'm out uh, filming, for whatever reason I feel most connected when I'm shooting over the bay towards the north where the, uh, the Big Dipper is, and that came right through with the Big Dipper and with the cricket sounds. It's like, it was a lucky moment for me. Um, this is interesting because, um, let me see here. This, Jeff, is when I was away in the summer and I came back to New Brunswick. Um, it may be, I'm wondering if it's easy for you to see on your screen there, but just, it was more dramatic in real life, but just there was flashes everywhere that, and it lasted for, 12 minutes, I'm not gonna make you suffer with 12 minutes of this, but it was just remarkable just to see this, these lights that were just um, um, going off everywhere. I can see that. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether um, after rendering this, if the quality would uh, um, remain, you know, as, as good as I would hope it would. But it, it, I can see it here, but yeah, that to me, this was, Unexpected, but I, I don't see this very often, that's for sure. And I'm not going to make you watch 12 minutes of it, but yeah, I can just move it along a little bit and then you'll just see that, it, you know, different places that it's, it was very odd. Yeah, it's interesting. And then I can just, would you like me to go to the next one? Sure. Okay, this one actually is a still image. Um, because I shoot video and I know you, you work with video as well. If you have a, a, a card that starts to fail and, and you get issues with the, um, uh, pixelation that this was odd to me because it was a pill shaped, um, object that shows up as it does. I'm zooming in on it now. And then I'm zooming on, zooming in it, zooming in on it again. That only showed in one frame, which I thought was odd because I've had this happen before. It's so multicolored. It showed up in October, but I thought it was cool. What it is, I don't know, but it was interesting. Um, this one is called A Light in the Sky. This only happened twice. Uh, this was August in 2022. It happened um, on the 11th, and then it happened again the following night. This, I remember it seeming brighter than it, than it, than it appears in the video. And this is the same thing again the following night. And it's hard to tell when it's handheld, um, but it wasn't traveling a completely straight path. It wasn't zigzagging all over the place, but it was kind of curving along when it was traveling. This is from April this uh, past year. And this one is, this is in the house that I'm in now in the backyard, again with the psionics. Do you see that object just traveling up past the uh, the antenna mm -hmm. that is when i do these um ce5s or just um I put out an intention and call these things in i get a lot of this or similar this one is from 2022 and it's a triangle of some sort you'll see three lights that are ascending I'm zooming in on it here so you can get a better look. I'm assuming it's three separate crafts because it's not blocking out the sky. No, the star field is completely evident um, as you're as you're looking at it. But look at how tight the formation is. Yeah, and, and they don't spread apart from each nope. other. And, and I thought this is the perfect punctuation. This nice little fly through that came through at the end. I mean. That was amazing. I wish there's a light, I think, because it was 2022. I can't recall if I had the camera inside, but there was a light on that was giving a little bit of reflection, which kind of diminished it being a little bit better than it could be. But I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, capture. This is from last October. And um, as I play it, I can describe what happened. It was a cool evening when I set the camera outside to record, but I stayed out probably for about 20 minutes doing an incantation or a, trying to call in the craft with a CE5-like protocol. And I went out to check on the, the camera sometime later, and I was walking toward the cliff, and there was this orb that I'm, I'm assuming was about the size of a, a baseball, and it was about five feet above the ground at, at the top of the cliff. 
but I felt because I was aiming the camera at the Big Dipper that the angle of view, I thought I'd be shooting at too high an angle for it to capture them. And I not only got it, but there were six that were coming through. And they were all traveling the same path. And here comes another one. I think orb four gets really bright. I'm just really thankful that I was outside to see one of them with my own eyes. And how far do you think you were from it? Oh gosh, not that. I would say probably about 50 feet, maybe. And probably when I saw the last one, I was closer because I was, the camera would have been about 50 feet from that tree that you see to the right. Now, some people may say that what you're seeing are um, drones or falling stars. How would you refute that? I, you, you know what, to be honest, you, how can you refute it? Because I have no proof that, that it isn't that. The only thing that I can offer to just say that I don't think it's that is that I was out to catch the last one. And I was standing near the, the cottage, probably about 40, 50 feet from where that orb was. It was, they appeared orange, or it appeared much more orange than the video indicates. Well, I would think that if it was a drone, you would be able to hear it at that distance. You'd be able to hear it, but then why would there be multiple passes? Right. And then they just fade out when they get to the um, to that evergreen. Um, but no, you're right. I think that any anybody that records a video and clings to a belief that it's absolutely something from another world or another dimension or somebody coming from, from our past to visit, I think you have to be circumspect and, and consider that, you know, things can be um, mislabeled or uh, misidentified. But when I saw that with my eyes, my first thought was, I hope I got it on video. If I'd seen the video without having um, caught one with my own eyes, I might be more doubtful that it wasn't something. But what I find remarkable is that they, each one of them was traveling the same path all the way through. It didn't look like it was, you know, traveling up. If it was a drone, maybe there'd be a, a bit of a, I don't know, a wobble in its path or, or whatever. But this just seemed, let's put it this way, it could be anything. But I, I just did see one and it did seem like it was a, 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 an event that it was hard to explain. At least I can't explain what it is. Okay, this is an interesting one. This is where you're going to see at the top left-hand corner a couple of objects. And again, at first I thought they were Starlink, and I showed this to a couple of people. And they went, no, I don't think so. What it is, I don't know. But you're going to see something. They're hardly moving. Um, and I'm not, there's one of them there. And you'll see in a minute when it zooms out, it's, it doesn't have conventional aircraft lights. But when I zoom out, and you're going to see, when I increase to, to uh, four times normal speed. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the, they're descending. There's one, two, three, and then there's a fourth one here. But what's odd is that by scrubbing through the footage, that's how I saw the movement. If, if you're just out looking at the night sky, you'd hardly even detect that those things were, were there and that they were moving. So I thought that was an interesting capture, and that was from last October as well. Um, this is prosaic, I'm sure, but to me, this speaks to, I think, people just maybe going out and enjoying the sky more than a lot of people do, because if it's not anomalous, there's some incredible stuff that's just remarkable. This that was not expected. <laughs> I thought that was phenomenal because you're just sitting out there. It's so serene. And then boom. And it was so much brighter than in, in real life than it was, you know, looking at it on, on, on camera or on playback. Can you play that again? Of course. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, look at how it lit up the clouds. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. 
So I think if people even just go out and just look at the stars for entertainment, never mind looking for anything anomalous, there's all kinds of uh, amazing stuff out there. Now this one, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Slow. Oh, this one might have been. This one was odd because um, I can't see any wings or anything to indicate that it's a plane or a drone. I'm going to zoom in on it so you can get a better peek at it. This is just a little over a month ago. Well, it looks like a Tic Tac. It's certainly the closest um, one that I've seen it by day, that's for sure. So that was kind of unexpected. And this is, again, by leaving the camera out, but I always find that there's a, a correlation between um, setting an intention, going out and doing a CE5, and I find, Jeff, if I'm recording, say, for two hours, three hours, usually I find that these things occur very early in the um, in the recording session, within the first half hour, usually. Not always, but I think, think that that's just worth, um, worth, worth noting. Here's another one called um, Two Lights or Two Light One Craft. Should be Two Lights. This is what I thought I was showing you earlier, the one that where the things were descending is what I thought this file was. But in the top left corner, there are these lights that are moving very, very slowly that you wouldn't even really notice moving if you were just out enjoying the night. And when I zoom in, it makes it look a little bit more like there's more movement than before zooming in, but they keep a very close relationship to one another there. And it's going ever so slowly. I'm going to move it ahead because you're just going to see it drift out of frame. And then what I do is I speed up so you can just get a sense of you'll see it coming through right about now, four times speed. And again, it doesn't look like there's any aircraft lights or anything that would be, you know, in that kind of realm. Whether it's a drone, I don't know. But it's, again, something that when you scrub through the footage, when you see unusual movement, then you kind of take a closer look and you think it could be something. This was interesting in that this was shot in the backyard over the, uh, over the house. And often when you get these fly throughs, I get single frames of I'm, I'm holding it here. Now that zoomed in, so it's very pixelized, but just that flash and fly through, um, I thought was interesting. Can you share with us what your CE5 procedure is? I can, I, I think mine is kind of just my own. Um, I looked at Stephen Greer's protocols and then I've looked at videos and talked to people to do CE5. What I do, when I first started doing it, I didn't really have any results. And I think I was trying too hard. I'd go out and I'd say, thank you. And if you can come through, it would be wonderful. And if it's safe for you to come through, please come through, but don't if it's not safe. And then I just relaxed and did a lot more um, just going out appreciating um, and doing a meditation and not working so hard. And that's when things really started to happen where things would just show up. Um, so it's a really simple process. I ground myself because I, you know, I don't want to advocate that people go and do this without being grounded, or maybe they should do it with somebody else. Because if something happens, you don't know what's going to occur. But, but as far as I'm concerned, it's all been for me benevolent, wonderful. It's a great hobby. But um, I do think that when you go out and you're relaxed, you get results. One great example was I had a relative that visited from Connecticut, not into the into UFOs or any of this stuff at all. And we had a campfire. My mind when conversation was about whatever was on what was happening up, up in the heavens. So I was thinking about wouldn't it be great if when this guest is visiting that we get a, a, a fly through of, of sorts? Nothing happened. So I gave up. I just started having conversation about whatever. 
were sitting around and then suddenly um, flying toward the west, right at the at the height of the cliff was a bright white. It was, it's like a, a Tic Tac or something that was, I don't know if it was solid, but it was a white light that just zoomed by. I only saw it out of the peripheral. I didn't see it directly. There were two other people there. One saw it directly and saw there's a rock that's uh, in the water that's just west of our property that they saw this thing turn and go behind the rock. I didn't see that. The guest saw not, it didn't see it directly, but saw it more than I did. And their reaction to it was really interesting. It reminded me of how I reacted to the uh, craft when I was 12 years old, because I thought that they would want to discuss it. Like, wow, wasn't that amazing? Nothing. The next day, he didn't even mention it. But I think when people's, um, you know, sense of reality doesn't include these possibilities, it's really easy just to shut it down. And I'm not going to push it. If somebody doesn't want to talk about it, I'm not going to broach the subject or, or bring it up. And I've never mentioned it again, but they didn't really want to have anything to do with it. Maybe they just wrote it off as a falling star. The, yeah. The only thing is, you know, Jeff, when something is traveling along beside you and then somebody sees it turn, it that was not a shooting star. What it was, I don't know. But I've had so many really interesting experiences. I do know a fellow by the name of, um, oh, he does um, some amazing work with the Council of Eight. Um, and you make Kevin Briggs. I don't know whether you've ever interviewed Kevin. The name is familiar, but I don't think I've had, had him as a guest. Well, he did a talk, an online talk that I wanted to see. So I, when I was in New Brunswick, I went to my neighbors, took my laptop over to their place because they have better Wi-Fi. And as I was walking over, for whatever reason, I just turned back to look at my place. And I, I could have done that anyway, but it was weird that when I turned, it was dark. There was something flying from the um, south going north over the water, just like another white streak. And I just kept going and set up to watch Kevin's presentation. Coming back, I turned to the right just to look toward the, uh, the Big Dipper after the presentation and just saw this orange flash. Thought nothing of it, but I wrote to Kevin just to say how much I enjoyed his presentation and told him I had these two, you know, they were like bookmarks. One incident before his talk and one after. This guy is so down to earth and grounded. Um, he just said, let me check. He checked with the council and he said that they said that it was them because it was showing an appreciation for his work and for um, wanting to learn more about the council. It sounds absolutely bat, you know what, crazy, but I'm beginning to think there's a lot more to consciousness um, and the intent that whatever these um, things are that, you know, that are involved with us, what they can do. But I just thought that by witnessing what I saw relating to what Kevin said, that there's a, there could be very well a connection. After getting all this footage, how have you changed as a person over time? I think, you know, to be honest with you, the, the change to me is that because I view this as a benevolent, um, I, I see it as benevolent. Some people may disagree, but I've had no problem. I think that it's made me want to be more thoughtful, to be more kind where I can be. Um, I think that for me is the takeaway. I think that, you know, going back to what we talked about with the, that bless that came over me for a full six months, felt like the most kind um, emotional response to this. And I think that returning um, kindness to others, to animals, to the planet is something I'm left with. And I, I can't tell you, Jeff, whether that is something that I'm connecting because I want to make that connection or whether it's, you know, something that is draw, drawing me to do um, more kind you know, things in, in my life to do more volunteer work. Um, I'd like to help experiencers that are finding it very difficult to reach out to people because of fear of stigma and that type of thing. But I don't understand it. But I do think you're, you're, that's a good question. I do think it's changed me because I'm drawn to do this. Um, before 2022, there was no um, compulsion to go out and buy night vision gear. There was no interest necessarily in setting up a camera and um, 
recording the night sky, but I did. So I think it's got to come from somewhere. And I also think what's interesting is maybe they want to work with this um, through these kinds of devices because 30 years ago, uh, consumer grade electronics that um, offered night vision um, capability didn't exist. Um, cameras that could record on memory cards that are cheap and ubiquitous, they weren't as uh, readily available. I think things are at our fingertips now to bring these things into clearer view. And I find it, it's a huge hobby, um, but I'd love to share it with people. I haven't set up a YouTube channel to share some of the videos, but it's calling me to do that. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people, when they post their videos, add music to them. And um, for some reason, I'm I'm told, and I say when I say told, it's just an internal voice. Do not add music because I feel that's kind of curating somebody's response. It's kind of tele telegraphing the response that I want by put putting a certain type of music in how they should respond to it. So I'll just let the crickets and the uh, the the natural noise. Um, you know, complete the uh, complete the picture. I didn't ask you this earlier, but how did you wind up on a ship when you were in the craft that time? The first time, Jeff, that I can remember being on a craft would be about five years old. And the interesting thing is I have absolutely no memory of ever being taken. I'm just there. Am I there physically? Or am I you know, are they taking me on some sort of a soul level, on a soul level way? Um, am I astral traveling? I don't know. But I know when, I, when I'm there, when I was five years old, I remember being alone and walking down a corridor that was curved and the walls were, you know, curved as you would expect, maybe a, um, a Tic Tac or some sort of a craft that is shaped that way. And walking into a room, there was no one there with me and it felt really weird um but i i've never had a sense of being taken i don't know that you've spoken to other experiencers who have had that sense of just being there but not the uh, the actual journey of getting there besides the ufo activity what other paranormal experiences have you had well actually after doing hypnosis uh, a number of things that i thought about um, being potentially uh, ET related, but not completely, came into clearer view. And I'm not one that remembers my dreams all that clearly, like I might remember 10 dreams a year. But when I was about five years old, I had two dreams that would replay, like almost nightly, and they were terrifying. The first dream that that I can, can tell you about was waking up and going to my window or going to the front door of the house, opening the door and finding it, there were just bricks. The windows, you'd open the drapes, bricks. No one was in the house. I was alone in a house. And to me, to me, that speaks of being captured or um, being removed from your, um, the comfort of your normal existence. And that dream would replay and replay and replay. And to me, it makes sense. Probably it's a relating to an on-craft experience. That's one. The other one was, um, again, I would have been, it would have been in the 1960s in reality, but a car that would have been from a much earlier vintage, uh, a sedan, a black sedan, had me in the car. I was alone in the back seat, and the car was starting to roll off the driveway and take off. I was terrified. I was alone and I was going with it. Of course, that's when I wake up. Never really thought much about it, but after doing the hypnosis and um, examining things, to me, that's being taken. I was alone and this thing was going and I had no control. The other dream happened when I was probably um, just getting in, into my teen years. And that involved being um, in a subway tunnel, like just standing on the subway tracks, not at, sta at the station level, but into the tunnel some somewhat. And then all of a sudden a train is coming and I'm trying to negotiate how much time I have to safely get back to the platform before it catches me. And again, to me, I can clearly see how that would, um, 
speak to an ET encounter, where it's a screen memory showing up in dream form. Um, but those were really um, haunting dreams that were never, ever, ever um, giving me a break. So those are those are coming from hypnosis. Ian, can you share with us some of your UFO research? Yeah, I think that I'm, I'm using CE5 as one of the protocols. And one aspect that I found a couple of years ago that I find really works is uh, um, something that Jimmy Blanchett um, is a, 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 a scientist who, who's in Arizona and he has a very large telescope array. And he's found that by using these very inexpensive uh, ham radio handsets that you can send out a signal and you can get a return. And if you have two radios, you usually get the return on the one where, where that you've sent the, uh, the message through. The video that I just showed you was interesting because I was looking at some video that I shot the night before and I was asking the radios for confirmation by looking at the screen if what I thought were meteorites might be something else. And they were going off like crazy. And then they settled down. They're making this recording on August 26, 22. And late last night, actually early this morning, probably at around three in the morning, out in New Brunswick into the Bay Shore, we do this protocol where we're playing an audio file prepared by Jimmy Blanchette, which is a CB5 protocol. Right now I'm looking at the monitor. This is the editing software. I'm just going to play this through. And after the end of this audio file that you'll hear, about 25 seconds later, there's one fly through a craft or something that goes through frame. And about 25 seconds after that, another does. This is about 40 seconds approximately before this clip ends. And then I'm going to walk over to the two ham radio, portable ham radios that I've got. Because we're getting confirmation when we use mindfulness and consciousness when we're out or when we're now looking at the video and then asking for confirmation. So I'm just going to see if we're lucky enough to see this happen right now. So I'm just going to play the last part of this video and then go over to the radios to see if the visitors are confirming that they're aware that we A, saw this last night and B, that we're reviewing it on the computer right now. an object fly through. It looks a little bit like a shooting star. There it goes. And then we'll have another. And this seems to be a direct response to when we um, do these radio broadcasts that there's a confirmation with these objects. And they go through very quickly and then just seem to kind of go into another dimension almost. There we go. That was the second one. Now I'm going to walk over to the radios to see if, through mindfulness and consciousness, there they go. We just played the video, and the radio is now chirping. It's set to 144.1, which is the uh, frequency that Jimmy Blanchett finds works well with consciousness and radio contact. Interestingly, there are two radios that you can see here. They're both turned on. Both of them set to the same frequency of 1441. You know, Jimmy is a scientist who understands way better than I do radio frequency. And he expresses the opinion or the fact that when two radios are set to the same frequency, they should both be receiving a signal. But with this protocol, it's almost as if they're trying to let you know that there's a situation that's truly miraculous because they're sending on a frequency something that is being received only by one radio and it's still going. And it does seem repeatable. It seems that there's a very direct response between 
reaching out and then sitting back using consciousness and listening. But anyway, I just wanted to give you that as a demo in terms of what I've been doing here in New Brunswick this year. Sometimes they're chatty and sometimes they're not, kind of like me actually. The interesting thing is it's on their terms, they're in control, and there goes the other one independently. I guess the other one didn't want to be left out. But anyway, it's been a really interesting summer and contact is definitely possible for I think most people who want to try it. The recording you just saw was after the third time this happened. I thought I just better get my phone and record it. What's really interesting about this protocol is that anyone can just get these these radios, use them, do experimentation. I find that there's there's a connection. Whatever it is, I don't know. But the most fascinating element is that um, if you take a conventional radio and put it in a Faraday bag, it will kill the signal. When these things want to chirp or indicate that there's um, something coming through, it will work in a Faraday bag. So whether these are actual uh, radio signals triggering these radios, I don't know. But it's another modality that I feel lends credence to there being a consciousness connection. Um, I find that the radios can be active every day in a week, and then they might go quiet for a while. But yeah, it's one one thing that I found quite fascinating and I enjoy using them. But it's weird when you're editing and they're giving you directions. So that's been kind of an interesting element. That's amazing. Now I noticed that the volume was turned off on your ham radios. If you had the volume turned up, what would you hear? On those radios? Uh-huh. The volume was up. Oh, it was? Well, I didn't hear could anything. You hear the, could you hear that? I, I, I really couldn't, I couldn't hear it. Yeah, yeah, they, they, um, they sound, it almost sounds like a chirping sound. Um, there are people that are trying to decode what the message might be. There's a woman that I know that I communicate with that, and we do some of this work together. Um, she professionally is a psychiatrist, but she's uh, an experiencer. And she recorded some really interesting, um, she got her phone, I guess, and just recorded the audio of these ch -ch 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 sounds. But hers were coming in um, very rhythmically as if there was, um, um, if they weren't as random as a lot of the stuff that I get. She sent it to Jimmy and he just said, that's really interesting. Somebody should look at it. And I think she sent it to somebody who's trying to figure out what these things might actually be trying to, you know, relay if there is a message. But I do find it interesting because um, who would have thought? Uh, he's an experiencer and I think this has come to him through, um, through some means, but I don't know whether he would have come up with it without having that experience or background. Ian, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Yeah, no, I'd be delighted if anyone would like to reach out. The best contact would be my email, and it is, the first word is contact, dot Ian, I-A-N, dot Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, -L, at gmail.com. All right. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with a one last positive message? I think there are a lot of experiencers out there who, like me, may have let many years or decades go by for fear of stigma, for fear of being judged by family. And I think we live in an age now where we're, we're, well, we're talking on Zoom now. People can make connections with people all over the world. You don't have to leave your home. It's a lot easier to reach out and be with people that you may be able to have um, community with. So I just encourage anyone, rather than waiting decades or years, to think about maybe how easy it might be to use the internet to find a local, doesn't even have to be local, but there's so many support groups out there that can help those that are looking for answers. And I think that might be my best guess for that type of uh, question. Ian, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care, Jeff. Thank you again. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.